Hi everyone, my name is Jiva Kleindienst and together with Tadej Vindish, Alexandra Kostic and Peter Tomasz Dobrila, I am one of the curators of the International Festival of Art, Technology and Science, Kiblix 2021, entitled Virtual Worlds Now. I welcome you on behalf of Kibla, who has been organizing this festival since 2002. With a new long-term focus on, of Kibla on XR technologies and art in scope of RUK, network of art and cultural research centers, and considering that the past year has been the most virtual year we have lived so far, the key question we are asking at this year's Kiblix is what are the virtual worlds now? In December 2020, we launched Kiblik's panel discussion series, where we bring together international guests from different backgrounds, all working on the crossroads of art, XR technologies and science. The first two panels in the series focus on digital intimacy and XR industries. Today, we continue with our third panel discussion, and here I would like to welcome our tonight's moderator, art critic and blogger at We Make Money Not Art, Regine Debati. Regine will be joined by a group of guest speakers, artists Jakub Kutsk-Stinsen, Tanya Vujinovic, Sally Ann McIntyre, and critical biodesigner, Tina Gorianz, and synthetic biologist, Christina Agapakis who will discuss the panel's title question, Can Technology Bring Back Long Lost Nature? I welcome everyone and thank you for taking time to be here with us today. For all of you watching online, you can use for Q&A the chat on the right side of this screen, where you can post your comments and questions, which will be read by the moderator on your behalf. Thank you, and Regine, the floor is yours. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this Kiblix session that will look at how artists today are helping us connect with extinct animals and plant species. My name is Regine Debati, I'm an art critic and a blogger and since uh, 2004 I've been looking at the way artists, designers and hackers are using science and technology in a critical way. And today we are going to listen to some of the amazing minds whose work I've been writing about for such a long time. There will be five speakers. One of them is a very creative scientist. And then there will be four artists and designers who are well-versed in biology and in technology. Through their research and their projects, we are going to explore the possibility of uh, maybe um, bringing back to Earth some of the animals, the plants, and the ecosystems that are long gone. Now in science, uh, the attempts to create close versions of extinct species have a name. It's called the extinction. Although some do prefer to use the equally, equally dramatic expression of resurrection biology. This scientific movement uh, has an arsenal of tools such as cloning, uh, gene editing, or bad breeding at their disposal in order to bring to life approximations of the woolly mammoths, uh, the American chestnut tree, or my very favorite, the gastric brooding frog, which was the only known frog that used to give birth through its mouth. Now, the participants in the panel are also trying to connect to extinct species and time. Some of them use virtual reality, others use sound art, synthetic biology, or speculative design. The tools they use uh, might be quite different from one another, but I see many parallels between their practices, and I just mentioned two of them. First of all, uh, their works are grounded in scientific research, but they also use poetry and uh, the power of imagination to spark empathy and connect us with some of the species that we have lost. And I think that is precisely because they talk to our emotions that the creative practitioners make us realize not only what we have lost, but also what is still very much alive in our environments today. 
Another thing I found among many other things, but another thing I found remarkable about the work of Christina, Jacob, Tanya, Tina, and Sally Ann is that they make us travel through time. They they build bridges between the past, the now, and and the future. So this is what we're going to explore today. I just want to say one more thing uh, before we start the round table, is that as uh, Jiva said, uh, I said, if you have any questions, please, please write them down in the chat space, and we will pass uh, some of them to the participants of the panel towards the end of this streaming session. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce the first uh, participant. It's uh, Jacob Kutz-Stenson. He's an artist with a strong interest in ecology and natural histories. He's using uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and also other digital technologies to immerse us inside the nature that we would otherwise not be able to experience, maybe because it's gone or because it's been too deeply transformed by men or simply because we've uh, all forgotten how to look at the non-human living world. So Jacob has this uncanny talent to make us appreciate or, or maybe, maybe also re-appreciate the living world. He, he seems to meticulously collect information about the organic world and then he rearranges it and use it to build imaginary landscapes. So Jacob, uh, thank you for being here. The screen is all okay. yours. Okay, um, I'm just checking. You can all hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and you see my screen? Yes. Um, great. So, yeah, I'm going to present a few different projects um, and describe my method a little bit within this theme. So for every project I do, most of them take like many years to make, and I work with different field biologists or natural history institutions, as well as like poets and writers, sometimes musicians that are all interested in some way uh, ecology or natural history um, something we've lost in the natural world. So what we're seeing here uh, is an installation for the Venice Biennial two years ago with a work called Reanimated. And Reanimated is based on a, a bird that became extinct. So the bird was actually, it became extinct in 19, 1987, the same year I was born. Um, and I created it by interviewing an ornithologist, Douglas Pratt. Douglas spent 40 years of his life studying this specific bird that we see down here in the background. This is like a bigger uh, video screen. So I interviewed him and what he told me was that this bird that he spent 40 years of his life studying, you know, it's gone forever, um, but he's still painting it. And when he paints it today, it's his way of bringing it back to life. But, you know, he's not bringing the literal bird back to life. He's bringing it back to life as like as an emotion, as a memory, as a sensation, or a way of like thinking about a landscape. So based on his interview, like I interviewed him for an hour and recorded this, I created this whole virtual reality exhibition. And in the VR and like inside of virtual reality, like what you see in the background is a large screen and on the sides of these computers. So when you take on the headset, you sink into the world where this bird used to live. Um, and as you put on the headset, it's like your breathing becomes part of the pulse of this virtual landscape. So that your, your diaphragm, your own rhythm, your breathing, the pulse of you, enters the pulse of this virtual landscape. Um, and I will return to this work in one second, but um, I want to quickly also show just the way I show these artworks and think about them is that I go to a landscape or I work with a natural history archive, kind of go through time, back to species that are lost, or I go to specific landscapes and look at plants and rocks with scientists to find things that we might not know exist before you look for them. Um, and then I use technology because it's kind of a way of, you know, introducing perspectives to people in many different formats, in many, like at home, like we are now on computers in an exhibition space, or for example, in public. So sometimes I also show these virtual landscapes that I create outdoors or like large screens, for example, this is with a Serpentine Gallery in London, and it's like a, it's a redwood forest in the States, these forests that have started to burn a lot, that really started to be threatened. I 
went and scanned part of this forest and made a virtual landscape from it. Um, all of them are these like large public spaces like Times Square in New York, where I show this world. So what I really try to do is to focus on the virtual landscape and not so much necessarily is the work in VR, is it video, is it a painting, is it like the format doesn't interest me so much. What interests me is to recreate memories and stories about specific landscapes. So for the project that I showed before with the bird, I recreated the island, the Alakai Plateau. This is an island near Hawaii where the bird used to live. And we use like satellite data and different and extra um, textures and plants from the island that I, with different collaborators, digitize like different leaves, plants, <clears throat> these like feathers of another bird and it's an extinct raven on the island that you see these black feathers coming out of the out of some of the branches so I create like a remix um, remix that goes from Douglas's memory so this virtual reality artwork starts on this island in a way that looks kind of realistic and then slowly as you enter it in virtual reality the environment become more and more strange it becomes more and more an artwork rather than a representation of what was lost. So in this artwork, you actually never really see the bird as like a 3D model. You only see photographs of it, or you see fragments of it. And it all kind of just slowly morphs together into this biomass that engulfs your body. So as you're breathing with the headset on as a little sensor, you'll become more and more part of this landscape and it becomes more and more strange. And it becomes more and more like a, an emotion, like a slow emotion, a, a kind of poetic sensibility. And that was because Douglas told me that he paints the bird and that's how he brings it back to life. And I talked to another friend of mine, Brid Ray, and she wrote a book about de-extinction. She's an author. And she interviewed like uh, 60 different scientists, uh, scientists around the world, who are right now working with de-extinction. And what she, her perspective that inspired me from my conversation with her was that it's impossible to ever bring anything back to life. This is kind of like, I think it's kind of a tech fantasy of humans today to actually bring things back to life. What you always bring back is a transformation. Even if you bring back a mammoth, it's a mammoth born um, out of a current elephant. It will live different. It will have different social norms. It will eat different, so it will be different. But we create it from the human fantasy in the image of a mammoth, for example. So with Reanimated, I choose to never really virtually try to bring back the bird in a literal sense, but I tried to bring back Douglas memories and sensations and the kind of human, make evident to people the human impact on the, on the environment. Um, so that is kind of a, a very emotional artwork that I've been showing in different festivals and exhibition spaces. Um, yeah, so that was that work reanimated. Um, I want to focus a little bit now on kind of how I've gone from this way of working, of working specifically with the natural past to the present and looking for things in landscapes through technology and archiving them through photogrammetry and different types of scanning technologies and create libraries of formations in landscapes at really small like bacteria levels that we might never think about. So just like we have, you know, COVID as kind of this invisible force that's traveling around the planet and all of a sudden, it's changing, you know, how we're presenting in a festival right now, how we use technology, how we work, how we live. So this little invisible microbe has just changed everything on the planet. So for the past year, I've been in uh, Al in southern France, and I've been working in kind of a swamp wetland for one year and living very close to it and going to the landscape every day. Um, and this is a landscape that exists between kind of the the human realm, like the soil and the sea. And in between the soil and the sea is this strange landscape controlled by bacteria and algae and nothing else. So what we see in this picture is like water that's turned green because of algae and bacteria. So it's this massive landscape where these are the main forces and they kind of change everything. How things look, how things die, what can live there. Um, so I went out with, field, with different biologists here and they taught me to look for different types of formations in the landscape. Like what you see here is like a feather from a dead bird that's turned into crystal by salt. Um, and the back is like this kind of green water. So from this, from this kind of strange 
landscape that we might not really spend a lot of time looking in the detail at, I started to create a whole virtual landscape. So this is here is like a 3D object that I created. And in the landscape, it's just, it's just as big as this. It's like this little object. But in the winter, like one year ago, the sun was really high and everything became super dry. And all the water kind of evaporated from the landscape. So it meant that the salt from the sea just crawled up all the different objects, like this one, like this piece of wood or like this piece of soil with a feather in it that kind of is like super stiff and turned into a crystal. Um, I've been going around and 3D scanning like 100 different objects and recording the soil and the ground and different elements, the sounds of this landscape. And now we are mixing this together to build uh, like an online um, multiplayer VR landscape where people are walking around this actual place in virtual reality, but you're like this big. So this object becomes 100 meter large. So it's like using virtual reality to look at the landscape at this um, more like bacterial, otherworldly perspective um, and looking for objects that I never knew existed. So by going into a landscape, working as a digital artist, I become able to create objects that look different than anything I could just imagine. So I wouldn't be able to first draw this object or design it or choose to make it for a virtual landscape. This can only come into existence on this screen right now because I went through the landscape with my body. Otherwise, I would not know this existed. So now I'm focusing a lot on looking for elements and formations at really small scales in landscapes and preserving them virtually and showing them to people to show like a kind of local uh, curiosity uh, or magic. Um, yeah, so that was my presentation of my work. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Jacob. Um, I have a question that's, uh, that's maybe a bit uh, basic and banal, but uh, don't you find it a bit ironic that so many of us today need technology to appreciate the life that is surrounding us? Yes, I, I have kind of an ambivalent relationship with technology. Usually technology is the last thing that enter my artistic practice. It starts with a landscape, it starts with, a, it starts with anything else than technology. But technology is a way of like, you can actually have an aesthetic impact on people because people use it a lot. So you can kind of have two choices. You know, I can choose to not use technology at all and work in landscapes and create my art there. Or I can choose to introduce a different sensibility in a very like viral, impactful medium. So that's why I create what I do. It's like, I, I really, really think that we need more diversity in how we create virtual landscapes so that we don't just create them from the computer screen all the time. You know, we need to have to understand that there's magic and life and complexity kind of um, outside of anything we can imagine from in here or in our studio or in our company or in our art exhibit. Like, like we need to infuse something else. So for me personally, that is kind of what motivates me. Of course, every artist has their different, mm, you know, ideology and approach, but that's how I think about it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jacob. I actually have more questions, but I, I promised I would ask uh, each one only one question so that we have more time to, to talk together later on. So uh, the next uh, speaker is Tania Vujinovic. She's a media artist and a researcher, and her creative world work has uh, toured the world. Her practice is focusing on the many ways that technology is impacting and transforming the human and the non-human experience. And throughout her practice, she has collaborated with scientists to develop pieces that feature plasma generators or even reactors with nanotubes. And one of her works uh, has actually been selected to be part of the Kiblix Festival. It's called uh, Sphere 3, and it's a futuristic virtual garden and, and an ecosystem of uh, imaginary real things. There is a, a video on the, on the website of Kiblix, and uh, you get a better idea of what imaginary real things can look like. Um, 
I, I'm hoping, but she does what she wants after all, but I'm hoping uh, that uh, Tanya is going to talk to, her, to us about Carboflora, which is a, a virtual environment that uh, not only propels us into the vegetation of the deep past, but it's also keeping us anchored in today's reality by addressing our addiction to fossil fuel. And, and maybe if she has time, Tanya will say a few words about her current artistic uh, research that sounds absolutely fascinating because it's been inspired by a, a fully intact flower that um, has been discovered inside a number of fossils. So, so Tanya, thank you for, for participating in this conversation. And um, yeah, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, phenomenal introduction. So I guess I should just start sharing screen, right? And choose screen one and hope that it will work. And now I don't see myself. Interesting. <laughs> Aha, okay. It's okay now. Luckily it works. Can you see my screen or not? Yes, yes. Uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, I uh, will try to be on point and talk about uh, uh, current subject, although I might uh, mention some other things because projects are always envisioned as an uh, ecosystem that takes care of, for example, quality of air in the space or water and whatnot. And the Carboflora project that you mentioned is... Uh, one part of uh, uh, Sphere 2 that uh, I showed for the first time, I think, two years ago. And uh, maybe I should say a couple of things about uh, like my general practice. I happen to be working in media art, or some people call it new media art. I uh, don't know what to choose even nowadays uh, for like last 20 years. And... Uh, uh, lately, I've been structuring projects uh, to, to begin with in game engines. So I always want to make an environment and to think about the ecosystem. And I've been especially concerned with the quality of uh, air and water in our environments. And uh, I've been dealing with disinfectants way before this corona thing started. Uh, I think one installation was also presented in uh, uh, Kibla a couple of years ago uh, that dealt especially with the history of alcohol and disinfectants called spiritus uh, agens. Uh, so I will just uh, quickly go through my slides. Uh, cycle of works that I'm going to talk about today is uh, called uh, Meta Garden, and I've been uh, developing uh, each uh, group of works by spheres, and I always envision these futuristic constructions that kind of draw inspiration from the long gone past. Uh, and I've been also influenced by ancient sculpture uh, lately, which is really interesting, and about the mythology of uh, structuring objects in a way that they are multifunctional. And I was really fascinated how in ancient Greece, for example, and ancient uh, uh, temples, uh, they had objects that were also worshipped as divine objects, and they could do like multiple things for you. They can cure you, or uh, you can just chat with them and uh, like basically project whatever you want with them. And uh, essentially, this is where I draw parallels between our structuring of synthetic objects through technology uh, nowadays. And here are just like a couple of my most important research topics. Uh, I was always interested in immersive media, non-human agents, and of course, cyberspace and simulation. And especially in the last couple of years, this idea of what pharmacon of technology might mean for all of us. As we might know, pharmacon is the notion of something being either cure or deadly poison. And this especially ties with uh, the latest project I'm working on now. I mentioned, uh, Regine, this uh, to you, that my latest scientific advisor is uh, Professor uh, George Poiner from Oregon State University, uh, who was so nice to help me um, 
structuring this thing that might be actually like the first flower that appeared uh, on earth and we are just finished yesterday making that first flower and it's so uh, exciting. Uh, of course, this is just the proposal of flower. There is still not like scientific agreement, complete agreement in scientific community about what that first flower might actually uh, be. Uh, so as I mentioned, I always go from uh, this starting point that uh, uh, we either on one side construct synthetic objects through technology and the, uh, on the other side we always try to improve our situation and uh, think about all the implants and uh, high-tech devices we might add to our lives to uh, make our lives better or easier. Uh, and there is also a lot of problems with it because we have lost track of uh, pollution and stopped taking care about the environment so much as we maybe uh, had uh, the no notion of how to take uh, care of our environment in the past. Uh, so this is uh, how I think about synthetic beings all the way from the past, from like votive figurines to uh, sculptures to like cellular automata and all the uh, interesting e emergencies of uh, ways how artificial intelligence inf impacts our lives nowadays too. Of course, this other way of how uh, technology impacts human beings uh, through all of the things we try to, to create and structure our daily lives. So I will quickly jump in time 10 years or so, and go to uh, the cycle of works we mentioned before. Uh, at that time, uh, air quality in Eastern Europe was especially bad, and I started uh, uh, looking at all of the sites that actually track uh, various pollutants in the air. And at the same time, I started reading uh, literature, uh, like cultural analysis and also scientific literature about the usage of coal in the environment. And I got, got in touch with the uh, paleobiologist here from Slovenia. And uh, I started discovering phenomenal things. Like, for example, that... Um, uh, like the, the whole mythology of dragons actually started appearing where first sites of coal mines uh, were discovered. And this is uh, this happened because, uh, as you can see, roots of this ginormous tree looked like cramps of some like very big animal. And this is how all of these stories started emerging. But uh, there was also this really amazing book that uh, impacted me from uh, Esther Leslie about synthetic world where, where she actually said that the whole synthetic world that we started building uh, since the beginning, uh, since the, like the middle of 19th century uh, onward was extracted from coal, all of the uh, synthetic colors and artificial materials and whatnot. And I was also shocked that to this day so many industrial facilities still use uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and I was very lucky to uh, get this package of uh, structure of uh, reconstructed carboniferous plants that I purposefully stripped to white and made this whole uh, virtual environment uh, with it. And then also constructed this uh, a uh, third plant to uh, kind of monitor the uh, level of pollutants in the air. So basically, whenever you open the application, it just connects to the nearby database and uh, just uh, these plants start to uh, level themselves according to what happened. And there was a lot of talk about, can you actually see in the application how plants move? And in fact, you can't because just as in real life, you don't really see uh, 
you you can't really notice until until levels become so high that you actually start almost like choking, uh, unless you of course record like for five or six hours what's happening in the application, and then you can see like plants slowly rising or or shrinking. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, as I said, I always structure the projects as environments, so there was always uh, there is always some sort of like physical application. Uh, and in this case, uh, I also uh, made this uh, device that uh, ins was inspired by my dear friend Ariana's presentation. She's a young uh, a scientist who works on cleaning the, the water with the plasma, uh, which is like way more uh, cleaner in the environmentally friendly way to clean uh, the water. Well, wastewater, of course, and this is uh, also the water that can be used for sanitization. And uh, there are also a lot of like experiments uh, uh, in medicine as well. So this installation uh, looked something like this. This this is just uh, my research visit to Department of uh, Surface Physics at the Institute of Joseph Stefan, where they actually built the device for me, and. Uh, this is me at the Biological Institute uh, with uh, Ariana Filipic. Uh, and there was also another device that uh, had um, plates with uh, uh, nanotubes that actually clean the air. Again, one more way to clean the environmental air just by uh, using something uh, something different, something alternative that might uh, cause less damage in the environment, for example. And uh, maybe I should, uh, yeah, this is just, uh, this, this is also very fascinating to me. Like when I was the, for the first time witnessing uh, the zooming in with the electron microscope, into the matter itself, I was uh, I was really in awe. I couldn't even believe my eyes. <laughs> uh, so there was also another installation from the uh, same circle. Again, when uh, when I mentioned that I was really interested in last couple of years into how ancient sculptures were structured, and especially this installation was inspired by this mythology of compressing meaning into an object. And uh, I always uh, I borrowed this expression from Peter Lunenfeld of past future tense when you actually try to envision the future and think about the present by looking how certain things were understood in the far past. And uh, uh, this object actually had um, this brain with deep neural network that analyzed voices of visitors uh, in the gallery. And we trained this uh, network by feeding it a large library of uh, actors who read uh, same sentence with different emotions. And I, for example, have learned something from my own installation to stop being cynical. I didn't even understood what being cynical means. But not to strive too much away from uh, the topic, I will quickly mention the, the project that I'm working on now. Uh, Oh, yeah, this is also interesting. This uh, is a project that I worked on. Uh, it was a commission for Eurofusion. Uh, this is the, the international consortium that works on the promotion of fusion, fusion uh, energy. And this exhibition is also really, uh, it's going to be opened and presented for the first time near ITER. And as I assume, uh, you probably know that ITER is this huge uh, uh, new uh, reactor that uh, we are trying to build and maybe try to solve our uh, energy production problem uh, in the near future. And I will now go uh, to current thing. This is the Sphere 4, and this is the uh, port of elements of some of previous spheres that will be published in... Uh, uh, online social network uh, and uh, gaming also network in a way. And I actually call VR chat non-game game, uh, where there will be elements of, of also carboniferous plants and also ju and just 
uh, these four. Uh, I had to limit uh, the number of objects because it has to be optimized for uh, online viewing. And we are also adding this fantastic plant that uh, we, are, we are just building uh, with the help of uh, Professor George Poiner. And he actually was, I read that in uh, one text about him, he was uh, uh, the person who inspired the book Jurassic Park, actually. And I didn't know that. And the other plant uh, I'm going to include uh, into this sphere for is uh, also another one that he um, worked on. Uh, it's from the Strichinite family and it's very interesting to me because it ties really well with this idea of a pharmacon that can actually either kill you or cure you in a way. So maybe I should conclude my presentation now and leave it up for questions. I don't know. What do you think? Um, I think it was fascinating, Tanya. I was not expecting uh, the dragon to pop up like this. Yeah, um, yeah. always dragons are always present. But then, then we got uh, we got Jurassic Park. You know, each time someone is mentioning the extinction, uh, Jurassic Park uh, had to come yeah, out. Yeah. Um, yeah, the question I have I have from you is that you know you gave us a, a, like a very very quick and I, and I really thank you for for really going so fast. But uh, you gave us a, a, an overview of your work, and it's quite clear that uh, you work and you collaborate a lot with scientists. So I was wondering, how much do you do you want to stick to the to the purely scientific elements, and how much can you speculate? I, I think my question, if I maybe reformulate in a in a clearer way, is, is would be how do you balance between keeping your work scientifically accurate somehow, but also free in terms of uh, artistic expression? Yeah, I mean, I know exactly what you mean, because this is also something that I have to deal with a lot. And I also talk with that scientist a lot. And it's usually like that. If somebody is willing to invest their time into helping me in any way possible, either through conversation or to actually giving me some material, it uh, it does make my work more rooted into something that is, I think, truthful, and it gives it a bit of a, a strength and a grounding. But from that point on, I could not improvise, but actually create some sort of poetic uh, elements and structure around it and make something really inspiring for all of us. And I think the most important thing is to, on the one side, create something that is aesthetically and emotionally uh, appealing to people and that would provoke them to start thinking about this. And it can pull people in either through like interesting sound or appealing uh, visuals in a way. It doesn't really matter. The thing is that once when you're in there, in that location, things start to happen. And it's really different for variety of people. I've seen some people really being interested in technical aspects of it. Some really want to see scientific elements of the whole thing. Some people just really enjoy visuals and like being in presence of the object, for example. So that's all legitimate to me, really. Well, thank you, Tanya. Um, we're going thank to <laughs> we're going to hear from Christina Agapakis. Uh, Christina is a synthetic biologist uh, who spends a lot of time in the company of artists and designers. She has a PhD in synthetic biology from Harvard. She's a science writer. And she's also the creative director of Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a synthetic biology company based in Boston. Now, I have to say something about the first time I uh, discovered Christina Agapakis' work. She just popped up uh, on YouTube. Um, and she was interviewed and saying quite, you know, very eloquently and, and quite seriously how, um, together with the smell artist and researcher Cisal Tolas, she had explored the biology of our food and our bodies by crafting cheese using bacteria. They had both 
collected from human feet, nose, armpits, etc. But the reason uh, why I, I thought she would she would be a great speaker is that she has also led a team of synthetic biology to to help artists uh, Cicel Tolas and Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg recompose the smell of a flower that went extinct in Hawaii due to colonial activity. So, uh, Tristina, thank you for, for being with us. Hold on, I was muted. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I will, um, ooh, I'll share my screen. Can you see my slides now? Um, let's see, does that? Yes. Yes. There we go. Is that working? It yeah. was working. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, uh, here, I had, I, was, I had a second monitor, so I'm going to, can you see it now? Okay. Um, a little strange, but that's okay. Um, so I, as, as Regina was saying, I'm the creative director at, at Ginkgo Bioworks, um, and, th and this project really starts uh, at Ginkgo. Um, so I wanted to kind of explain a little bit, like it set a little bit of the tone. Um, Uh-oh. Uh, it's all, it's all good? You hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we're a synthetic biology company. Um, we design microbes for customers uh, who work in a lot of different industries. Um, people who want to make products using biology um, will come to us and we will kind of really enable them by using a lot of our technologies to help you know, bring that technology to life, as it were. And so a lot of our business a few years ago was really with the flavors and fragrance industry, um, working with uh, per perfume companies um, and, and flavor companies that are making um, these molecules, aroma chemicals, um, through lots of different kinds of chemical processes. So we said, you know, how can we use microbes um, to grow and ferment these, these ingredients? And so that's just the, the context that this project started in. Like our, our business is about using synthetic biology um, in, in the fragrance industry. Uh, and then synthetic biology itself is, is this kind of oxymoron, right? You have synthetic, you have artificial, you have engineering, and then on the other side you have, you know, biology and life and nature. And so as, as somebody who spends a lot of time in the company of artists um, and, and social scientists, I, I find this to be very interesting. And I, and I want to kind of like pick apart these, this duality that lives inside of synthetic biology. Um, and, and I want to also sort of challenge that um, and, and ask questions about sort of, well, has that split really always been there? <laughs> or, you know, what, what is that split that we put between nature and technology? Um, and, and how might that look different um, sometime in the near future as we do more and more genetic engineering? Um, at, the more we, like, mess with nature, um, how might our ideas of nature change? And so the this project the called Resurrecting the Sublime in collaboration with Daisy Ginsburg and Cecil Tolas um, is is a is a question yeah it is a project of resurrection of, of bringing back something extinct and something lost um, at the same time like asking questions about um, what is our relationship to nature the, the relationship between human culture technology um, and natural ecosystems in the past and in the future um, so this is the uh, the mountain slope on Haleakala in Maui in Hawaii um, and in the early 1900s Euro European settlers went to Hawaii um, and brought with them cattle um, and a number of other uh, kinds of in invasive species that they introduced to the islands um, and, and really transformed the whole ecosystem of the island. And so that plant, the tree that was there in the center, um, the Hibitus Cadelphus wilderianus, um, it very, very quickly went extinct after people um, introduced cattle that started grazing on these hillside, this hillside. And so that, that plant went extinct in 1912 was the last time it was seen. Um, and really this kind of, um, and, and I think that that kind of sets the stage too of this kind of like the, the, the way that people sort of the historical idea about the relationship between man, and I use that on purpose, um, and, and nature, like the idea that we can sort of like just bring our things wherever we want to do whatever and we can control these ecosystems um, and, and how that has been shaped over time um, and, and how we have, must sort of recognize and, and reshape that relationship um, if we're not to continue to lose um, things in the future. And so that's just to set the scene. So I didn't know that we were going to bring back the Hibiscadelphus wilderianus um, or, or even think about it. Um, when I started thinking about this project, I was really thinking about um, 
just this question, right? Like, could you do it? What if we could bring back the smell of an extinct plant, like using the same technology that we were using with the fragrance industry? And so I spent some, uh, a number of days in the Harvard Herbarium um, looking through the stacks and stacks of all of these envelopes are, are, are filled with pressed specimens of flowers, um, searching this very, very analog uh, database for specimens of plants that had gone extinct. Um, and and this, is the, this is the specimen of the Hibiscadelphus that's in the Hawaii, in, in the Harvard Herbarium. Um, that we were able to find and take a very, very tiny, tiny sliver um, of this specimen um, and then bring back to our labs in Boston. Um, so this is actually a DNA sequencer machine in, in Boston. Um, uh, we ended up actually also collaborating with a research group that sequences ancient DNA at UC Santa Cruz, their pilot genomics lab. Um, they really helped assist us like in extracting the DNA from those tiny pieces of, of plant tissue um, and, and then sequence it. Um, the data that comes out of that, those sequencers looks like this. is very short fragments uh, of, of DNA with little barcodes. Um, and then what we do is work with a computer program that can stitch those together. Um, and, and in fact, uh, sort of like, like in Jurassic Park, like you, um, the, the fragments aren't actually complete. Um, that we didn't, weren't able to have a complete gene sequence, so we had to fill in the gaps using sequences of similar plants um, that are still alive today. And so this was work uh, by a team of, of folks at Ginkgo who are bioinformaticians, um, people who are able to use these com computational sequences to, to uh, reconstruct um, these chimeric sequences of, of the enzymes responsible for making smells inside of plants. And so this is like not quite exactly how it works, but pretty close. Like I think there's actually like an API <laughs> instead of literally an email, but you you basically send this this DNA sequence um, that you want to reconstruct um, in an e an email basically to um, companies that synthesize DNA. Um, it comes like this in a tube uh, via FedEx a couple days later. Um, and then we're able to insert that DNA into the genome of yeast. Um, that yeast looks like this on a petri dish. Um, we grow it, and, and then using the instruments at Ginkgo, um, we can actually sort of smell the molecules that are made by that those enzymes. Um, so I, I use smell in quotes because it's not really enough of those molecules in that those tiny, um, like the tiny uh, bits of yeast that we're growing, um, but enough for these kinds of, um, of, of of like very, very highly sensitive instruments to be able to detect the molecular traces of what's coming off uh, of the yeast. And so that's what this data, that, that data looks like this. Um, and so we're able to really identify the molecules that those yeast are making. And then we partnered with Cecil Tolas, who, uh, as Regine said, is a longtime collaborator. We, we did once make cheese out of feet. Um, and uh, we worked together on this project. Um, she was able to pull from her library of smells that you see behind her um, to assemble uh, to assemble and really construct a, a, a smell um, of the plant that had gone extinct. And so, uh, and then, yeah, and then the, I'll, I'll show you these and then I can tell you a little bit more about the smell. Uh, we then worked also with Daisy Ginsberg, who designed these installations um, where you can smell um, the you can smell like through, so there's a little diffusers that release the smell through the box. Um, and, and as you stand inside, they, they, it releases the smell. Um, and then you have the rock there, the lava rock that represents the landscape uh, of the, um, of the Haleakala uh, mountain. And so the person who is smelling kind of like makes the connection between the landscape um, and this lost smell. Um, here's another uh, view of the installation, um, this in, in sort of a vitrine form um, with, the, with the landscape inside um, and the smell being released inside of the glass boxes. Um, I, I, I love this version and, and the versions that have this kind of vitrine feel because the idea is to sort of turn the Natural History Museum inside out. Um, you have to go inside of the vitrine um, and you become kind of like part of that history and, and part of the future of this, this potential lost landscape. And so I, the, the, the last interesting thing I think about the, the artistic exploration here and, and interpretation um, is to say that 
all of this, like all of the scientific work is, is itself also an artistic representation and an interpretation of what that smell could be. As Yaka was saying, like we can't bring these things back completely. Um, it's just simply not possible. Um, and the but but what we can do is sort of understand the little bits and pieces um, and bring back these fragments. And so in, in these vitrines, as you walk through, you actually get different um, combinations of the smell that Sissel was able to construct. Um, so you never get a full picture and, and every step you take through it gives you a slightly different smell to kind of represent how it is impossible to, to capture something completely. Um, I think that the the experience for me of, of, of doing all of this, like all of that technical work and being part of this really years long process to bring this back to life and then to be able to actually smell it. Um, it, it was a really emotional experience and it is something I've heard from other people who've been able to, to smell it in, in these kinds of um in, in the installations. Um, and I think that there is something about like the ghostliness of the smell um, and the abstraction and the emotional connection of, of between smell um, and yeah, and, and human emotion um, that does uh, sort of, yeah, it, it does bring home in a very emotional way, uh, like that these things are lost forever um, and that human humans did it. Um, and then, and I think with the, anyway, well, that's what I think. <laughs> so uh, I, that's all I have. Um, this is my contact info. If you have questions uh, or, or thoughts or comments and I'd love to answer questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, I have a question that's, that's maybe a bit of a provocation, but it was inspired by that photo of you in front of the computers in the laboratory. And I was wondering, does that look like me though? <laughs> it wasn't you. No, no, I think that's a, a colleague of mine. <laughs> we have the same uh, haircut. It's true. <laughs> Sorry, I was blinded by the haircut. But you know, I, I uh, for someone who knows very little about about synthetic bi biology, it would mm -hmm. seem that um, what the, the 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 discipline is doing is kind of applying the engineering mindset to life. And so, does that uh, like engineering mind mindset apply to life? Does it make biology more predictable and thus maybe more boring? <laughs> I love that question. Uh, I think it's a very, very good one. I think um, it, it's like a question that uh, I ask and bothers me all the time. Or like, yeah, that it is something that sort of drives a lot of my research for and, and everything that I've been thinking about for many years now. Um, because I don't, I'm. I'm a biologist, right? I came to synthetic biology because I thought biology was awesome, <laughs> um, and I and I thought it was the right way. We wanted I wanted to turn com uh, computers into living things, um, like not the other way around, right? Like I think a lot of people who sort of start launch synthetic biology, some of my best friends and colleagues, um, are are really engineers who come to biology and say like, oh. Biology should be more like computers. I think I think where we're meeting is somewhere in between, um, and, and somewhere much much more interesting, um, where where it really will be about bringing technology to life and and thinking about like what are the things that are sort of special and magical and powerful about biology, the way that it is regenerative and sustainable, right, and and grows itself and it adapts and evolves. Like that, what if our all of our technology could be like that? Um, that's where I think the real sort of power and and, and interesting stuff is, is going to be able to happen. So while I'm, can you turn your, your camera on? Because there is a, someone, some, Sebastian, uh, but we, uh, apparently they don't see you, but we can hear you. So I think that's what matters. I'm, I'm here. I don't know how, can you? Um, well, the question is, uh, ah, maybe, Yes, we see, we see you now. So we have a, a question from Sebastian. We have several of them, actually, and they're all very good. And so I'm going to be cruel and just uh, select a very fast one. So is the, the process of recreating the smell of the extinct uh, flower, has it been published in a journal? Uh, it has not been published in a journal, no. Okay, since you, you are very good at answering yes or no, I'm going to uh, read the second question. Is, uh, sure. and that, was this work shown to indigenous Hawaiians? 
uh, it was not, we have not gotten the chance to show it in Hawaii, um, but we, we have had some conversations certainly with uh, indigenous Hawaiian researchers, um, uh, folks who are, who study, uh, yeah, like STS researchers who also happen to be indigenous Hawaiians um, and, and sort of, I, I did do some work with, um, uh, but I would really love to do more with that community and, and, and speak more with, with folks there too. Yeah, it's it's a really it's a great project. I I actually I I could smell also the the flowers in uh, in in Germany, and it's between. No, that, that's not possible. That's not possible. And wow. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, thank you. Um, thank you. Right. <laughs> um, so. We're going to hear from Tina uh, Gorians. Uh, she's a researcher, a designer, a consultant spe specializing in material exploration. And Tina is also a trend forecaster. And I must say that I'm really not surprised that companies would rely on her to get an idea of to what tomorrow's trends might be like, because she's not only a, an award-winning designer, but she's also developing works and scenarios that imagine the impact of tomorrow's scientific research on consumer culture and society and on our understanding of life and authenticity. One other thing I want to say about Tina is that she's also a visiting practitioner at Central St. Martins in London. And I really want to say uh, an extra thank you, Tina, because uh, I know, you know that in order to accept this invitation, uh, you had to make a few changes in your agenda because you were supposed to give lectures right now. So, um, yeah, Tina, uh, we're listening to you. Okay, I'm aiming to share my screen. <laughs> Is it working? Oh, sorry. Is it working? Not for me, but uh, maybe. No. What about right now? It says it's loading. I don't know why it's taking so long. Sorry about that. <laughs> OK. Uh, it... OK. Oh, shoot. Yeah, is it fine now? Okay, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about it. Oh, <laughs> happy to quickly. <laughs> Okay, because I'm able to move quite quickly through the presentation, actually. Yes, of course. Okay. Okay, sorry about that, you all. And yeah, thank you, Regina, for the introduction, a really kind introduction. So, yeah, as Regineette said, um, I specialize in the formation of speculative scenario. And the aim for that is uh, to project possible futures or alternative fut futures and alternative product. We aim to reevaluate our current beliefs and values we actually hold towards nature. So I would say I'd look at the design outputs almost as uh, tools to initiate a debate or a change. And the aim for that is actually about uh, sparking critical thinking to either help set in place today's uh, factors that will increase the probability of achieving more desirable futures or spot early the factors that are leading to undesirable ones, uh, which can be also hopefully then addressed in advanced and limited. So 
So in the context of this conference, I am presenting two of my projects uh, throughout which I actually ask the same question as for the title of this live stream. Uh, but in both of those projects, I approach the question through a slightly different context. So in the phylogenetic atelier, which is the project I'm going to present first, uh, I look at the de-extinction process to restore back long-lost species, while in my most recent uh, work and also currently still ongoing research, which is titled Harvest, um, I almost like dive into the world of legally prohibited materials that are driving uh, species to extinction. So to start with the phylogenetic atelier, uh, I started this project by recognizing how uh, we as a society have put our expectations to pro for someone to provide sustainable solution that could regenerate the lack of our biodiversity on shoulders of our scientists and engineers. And they are obviously responding uh, to those expectations with all of those ambitious plans toward redesigning and reprogramming living organisms, which is also presenting us with this tempting future scenario in which we are able to save our decaying planet. Uh, so the field of synthetic biology is especially one field that has presented uh, several attempts to restore the, this lost equilibrium between what I would almost call Earth-first logic and the human indulgence, uh, or which we could also call an exploitation of our natural capital, and which is becoming uh, more, almost like a luxurious commodity nowadays. However, um, as we have become, I believe that as we have become mostly driven by this aspiration to constantly innovate in order to tackle those environmental problems, we are also starting to lack the ability to analyze the cultural understanding of what we are actually exper experiencing in this process of innovating. And I think while we do that, all definitions and stereotypes, uh, for instance, between like just comparing something original versus fake or natural versus synthetic or dead or, uh, and alive are becoming quite obsolete. And so this project for me advocates for the need to readdress the currently obsolete vocabulary that is surrounding the field of biotechnology and almost uh, propose our recategorizations of the outputs that are produced by the means of this new technology. So focusing on the need for specificity, especially when it comes to uh, exposing the source and the production methods that are required for the formation of those bioengineered materials or bioengineered organisms. And here we can see uh, the portrayal of this future scenario that I envision for the project, which combines uh, three different, totally different practices. One is the practice of laboratory work, then the museum environment, and uh, a, luxur a luxury artisanal glove workshop. And the later is also hinting at the commodification-based uh, relationship we actually hold towards nature. So the project is, uh, to is uh, inspired by the research and the fundings of the Great Passenger Pigeon Project, which is an, initi an initiative uh, that is carried out by Revive and Restore, an organization based in California. And this organization is probably best known for trying to revive and bring back to life the mammoth. But they are doing a couple of other de-extinction projects as well. And Two reasons why we specifically focused on the passenger pigeon are that, for for instance, the first one is that there this is the research that is the most further ahead. So, by they are uh, aiming at releasing the softly releasing the the species by 2035, which is not too far ahead. And then the second one is that actually this is the original case study upon which all of the other de extinctive initiatives are formed on. So the products that are displayed in this fictional venue that I just described 
are uh, gloves made from pigeon leather and p uh, pigeon leather sample. And the species that was actually used to produce the, sam the sample uh, is the bantail pigeon, which is also the same s subspecies that is used as a surrogate to de-extinct the passenger pigeon. And I apply different surface manipulations uh, and techniques to, in order to uh, mimic the slight changes in texture and color so that the, the, this skin will actually resemble and mimic as closely as possible the skin of the extinct species. And uh, the reconstructed skeleton, as well as a couple of blueprints, which I also produced uh, in the context of this project, uh, are, have also been made entirely based on data obtained from Revive and Restore. And again, they are showing the points of difference um, and the comparison between the two species. Oh, sorry. So I, I say one of the key revelations that came about while I was developing the project uh, was that actually the subtle difference in the texture, the color, and the chemical composition, alongside with the need to use an existing species almost as a canvas for the de-extinction of another species, um, would actually create a hybrid species, which is something that Jacob already talked about. And in my case, it will actually create a hybrid material. So with, the, with, with that, I think the project actually questions further the validity of categorizing the material as a de-extinct one, uh, or even a material from the past, as well as it analyzes like those cult uh, ethical implications of bringing something back to life, which will be completely dis displaced in our current environment. And so while the previous project focused on already extinct species, my current project focuses on uh, the potential of preserving the ones we currently still have, uh, but are driving to extinction mostly because of human lust. So I started again this project by researching the black market of rhino horns and find out that it has actually skyrocketed in the past few years, and that is all because uh, the authorities that are in charge of protecting the species are lacking in means and also in resources to successfully stop the poaching. And I can acknowledge that they have these several attempts in the past aimed at providing a sustainable solution or an alternative to the original material, which have really similar, if not identical, characteristics and, structure, and, and the structure. But unfortunately, uh, where most, most of, of those attempts have been actually proven quite unsuccessful, and not obviously from the material mimicking standpoint that was quite successful, but because they failed to meet the actual demands the, uh, of the customers which are searching this black market. So the project is based on the potential to create a keratin-based material uh, that is biologically identical to the substance which make up the entirety of the rhino horn. And uh, because of the amazing thermoplastic uh, characteristic of this material and its ability to be used as a base of vacuum forming or 3D printing, the material can be manipulated into products that are fit for our commercial market. However, where I believe that this project set, it really differs from all of the previous attempts of providing an alternative to the rhino horn, is that it's actually considering the source, which in this case obviously is a rhino, and the environment of the source. And this is based on the estimation that one of the key parameters which drives a rhino horn buyer to make the purchase is the clear link between the horn and its provenance which gives the horn its authenticity. So essentially, the project proposes that the differences in lifestyle and environmental conditions of our rhino will have a slight impact on the biological and textural composition of the material, and all of which can be safely replicated in the lab. So there are an example of uh, an African white rhino an Indian greater one horn horned rhino and an Indonesian Sumatran rhino are given to illustrate that this, the, the, this concept 
and suggest that the proposed approach could, uh, could actually offer a more involved role from the buyer of the horn. And by mapping out chemical and environmental factors that differentiate the materials of the horns from one to the other, and, uh, and uh, that the ability of the customer of the product to have an actual impact on the formation of this material, I believe that this pro product can promote a deeper connection between the material owner and the source. And this can in turn also lead to a shift uh, to the sometimes negative connotation and association with the terminology used to describe materials that are developed by means of synthetic bioengineering or even biomimicry. And with the future development of the project, uh, I aim to analyze the potential implication of a scenario uh, and depicting a scenario that offers a possibility to provide an overabundance of this currently scarce resource and then analyze the implication that this can have on the market value of the rhino horn. And this in turn could in my view, also challenge the mainstream view we hold towards the product or counterfeit objects. Thank you, <laughs> I guess. Thank you, Tina. I, I have, uh, I also have several questions, but I, I'm going to pick one because your practice uh, investigates, among other things, uh, the future of fashion. And I keep reading uh, articles uh, saying that fashion is facing new challenges today. There's the pandemic, of course, but there's also this raising awareness of how much our consumer culture is damaging the environment. So as someone who's follow fashion and what comes next, uh, next quite, quite closely, have you noticed that the fashion industry is looking into um, not just the extinct animals, but I don't know, futuristic vegan fabrics, eco-friendly pro processes, and, and other innovations that would help fashion reinvent itself again and be more in line with the environmental preoccupations of our time. Yeah, and I think there is a really good connotation between actually what you're asking me and some of the uh, proposition of my project, which is essentially, even though there are several attempts at creating alternatives using biotech and using all other uh, technologies as well, I feel my personal belief is that we are still creating a lot of stuff that we don't really necessarily need. And we, in some of the cases, unfortunately, those uh, material alterations are not really fulfilling uh, wh what they were designed for in terms of they are not really substituting, for instance, leather, but they are just offering an additional um, material which is going to be possibly market as well. What I think possibly we a more realistic solution to the problem, which is obviously a harder one to make, would be to completely reevaluate our values and beliefs and um, almost like rituals that we have in our society towards that specific commodity. And that will essentially enable us to uh, make a real progress in the direction that we are going. Because as we keep on drilling on and trying to uh, solve a design solution within the same context, I think we will always end up with the same um, answer. So therefore, I think uh, one of my personal key beliefs is that we actually need to change the environment in order to facilitate this change. But then you would not have a job anymore. <laughs> I mean, but that's, that's the, the exciting part of our, the future, right? The flexibility of the job. And even now we can see how quickly our jobs are actually adapting. And there is also a case study or several case studies showcasing that we, in the future we are not going to be uh, holding on to the same job for the whole time because jobs are going to be so flexible and going to be ch changing quite quickly. And we are going to live so old. Uh, Thank you so much, Tina. Um, our final, final speaker uh, today is Sally Ann McIntyre. 
Sally is a radio and a sound artist. She's also a poet, a writer, and a curator. And actually, I discovered her work a couple of years ago. She had traveled to Turin, which is the city where I live, to install a work that uh, used an extinct technology to reproduce the song of an extinct animal. And her installation was part of an exhibition about ghosts. And I think it was by far the most moving and the most haunting piece in the festival. So Sally's sound work also includes research into the materiality of recorded silence, the history of bird song transcription, the ontology of extinction and of evocative places such as uh, the Hobart Zoological Garden, which is um, now closed, but uh, was famous for being the location where the last Tasmanian tiger uh, in captivity died. The uh, last thing I want to say is, uh, again, extra super thank you to Sally because she's in Melbourne in Australia and I'm not very good at time schedule, but it's a barely day over there. It must be something like five in the morning right now for you, uh, Sally. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, the screen is yours, Sally. Thank you so much to you as well, Regine, and, and to the, the Kiblix Festival for, for having me here. And yes, as you say, it's, it's very early here in Melbourne. Um, I'm talking to you from Nam here in Australia on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung, uh, people of the East Kulin Nations. Um, in a pre-pandemic world, I live mainly in um, Otaputi or Dunedin in Te Waiponamu of the South Island of New Zealand, Aotearoa. Um, and these are the lands from which a lot of the projects that I'll be talking about here, were, they're, they're contextualised there. So I do apologise if, if it's all uh, a bunch of birds that nobody knows about um, in this audience. But, um, yeah, hopefully you'll learn something about them from, from this presentation as well. OK, I'll just try and share the screen. Um, just give me a minute to get the proper view going on. You can see that, right? Yes. Yeah, I'll just get the proper view. Oops, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, so I'm going to talk um, about a strand of work I've been developing the last couple of decades. Um, that began through a series of field-based sound and transmission art projects and has increasingly come to investigate the topic of species extinction. And I think it was really through just being a, someone who was going into the field as a sound artist and investigating environments and really um, yeah, doing these very small-scale um, uh, localised transmission art projects which collected field recordings and put them back into environments in sort of conceptual ways. But I really started to notice after doing a few residencies um, in uh, echo sanctuaries in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that um, it was a palpable um, part of the landscape, the things that were absent. So I think I'm speaking with a lot of the people here today in that sense, even though I will be talking about media that are a little bit more analogue uh, than a lot of you. So um, uh, in late September 2006, I participated in a month-long re um, Radio Revolt and International Radio Art Festival in Halle in Germany. And the central exhibition of that festival was called Das Graus Raschen, the, the Metamorphosis of Radio. And it was um, curated by um, Anna Fritz. And it included this work, um, Study for a Data Deficient Species, Grey Ghost Transmission. And I thought I'd start with this one because... This bird that this work is based on isn't yet extinct, but it's also not really um, something that you can go out into the field and have a look at. And um, it, the subject is um, an endemic bird called the Korkaku, the South Island Korkaku from New Zealand. Um, it was declared extinct in 2007 after no confirmed sightings for 60 years. And the bird had subsequently been reclassified after this as data deficient after a possible sighting in 2013. So I got completely um, interested in, in this notion of the data deficient and the idea that um, in the contemporary world with technologized practices, we, we do like to believe that we know everything about nature, that nature is fully mapped. That um, Yeah, but here's a bird that's... Um, you know, on the edge of extinction quite literally, in a liminal space of the 
sort of the unknown. We don't know whether it exists or it doesn't exist. So, um, so this work was about um, uh, a listening to that liminal space, if you will. So the categorization of data deficiency effectively places the South Island core cargo in this nether world, neither extinct nor living. Maybe it was still out there in, in the deep forests of the South Island, the remote forests, uncatchable by the quantification methods of data collection, and maybe not. Um, so my project took up this idea of data deficiency as a point of aesthetic interest, I guess, the idea that the cryptid or the unknown is somehow kind of a, a figure that, that can be used. Um, and so I collected together this library of sound files of the extinct bird, which were collected um, by a, a charitable trust called the South Island Korkako, um, uh, Charitable Trust, SICKET <laughs> was their acronym, um, and an ornithologist, um, a field ornithologist called Rhys Buckingham, um, who'd been looking for this bird for 40 years and had done most of these field recordings when the bird itself was declared extinct. So it's a citizen science project from an ornithologist who's just so dedicated, so obsessed with this bird that he wants to find it. Uh, so his his entire library of field recordings um, took one minute and 27 seconds. So they're the, the sonic content to this piece, but um, the piece broadcasts them on very, very weak transmitters. You can see one of my sort of home soldered transmitters in the picture there. They're not, they're not very sort of sophisticated technology, but that suited the poetics of the work, the idea that it drops in and out of signal, that there's a line where the, the transmission space ends. So this is the South Island Korkaku um, down the bottom, and there's its, uh, its still extant cousin, the North Island Korkaku up there. I went on to exhibit this work um, several more times. It's, it was as an evolving sort of counter archive of the collected material traces of the data deficient species. Um, and it was a progress, um, a process of accumulation that eventually took in other sonic elements. So contemporary musicians, um, which I commissioned, uh, such as violinist Sarah Clayman, who played archival Western musical notations of the bird's song on violin, and an Indigenous musician called Rob Thorne, who was playing a Taonga Pururu instrument or traditional Māori instrument um, called uh, the Puturino, um, which had been specifically developed in collaboration with this kind of bird. Um, as an inhabitant of multi-species worlds in pre-colonial environments. So these materials were transmitted by microFM in several gallery spaces. This is one, this is still in Halle. Um, uh, here's the letter, the, <laughs> the, the, um, the notation there in a private letter in an archive. So yeah, digging around in archives for these traces has, has been a big part of, of, of that kind of project. And this is a an iteration of it once it got to a form, a more sort of really obvious archival stage in, in Hobart, uh, in um, the Long Gallery in uh, Salamanca Arts Centre as part of the, the Dark Mofo Festival. Um, so, um, sorry, <laughs> I was going to play a bit of audio, but I think I don't really have time. So while in Germany for this festival, I also took the time to go and visit the archives of another collector, not myself, but uh, a previous collector called Andreas Reichek, um, who was a German, uh, sorry, he was an Austrian um, uh, taxidermist and amateur naturalist who uh, went to New Zealand in the, uh, the 1870s. And he spent 12 years collecting birds around the country. So I visited his archive in Vienna, the Natural History Museum in Vienna, and this is me um, having an emotional reaction to some of the uh, the stuffed kakapo um, that he was um, quite. He was a good taxidermist, so this diorama was very beautiful. But um, I found it very affecting to to see these. Um, and this this comes off the back of me doing um, recordings of the silences of extinct birds in other collections. This is me in 2010 in the Museum of New Zealand, Papa Tongarewa, um, looking at extinct huias and extinct other other sort of forest birds of New Zealand that are very culturally significant. Um, a lot of these uh, these works um, kind of, uh, they ended up in transmission art projects like this one, Collected Silences for Lord Rothschild, um, which is a, a transmission art project I did on a residency in Capity Island in 2012, which um, 
gathered together the silences of five extinct bird specimens and transmitted them back into the forest where they were originally. Um, but it's a reconstructed landscape in these eco sanctuaries as well. So it's sort of a constructed nature. So the engagement with the constructed nature and also the idea that these birds never quite got to um, these eco sanctuaries that were set up in the late 19th century and this great push to colonisation uh, kind of um, kind of recognition of extinction um, at that point. Um, so they were the ghosts in the landscape that I was attempting to put back into uh, these environments in a very sort of, yeah, unsuccessful way, obviously, because the recordings of the dead um, specimens are not really going to, to be audible in any way whatsoever. And, and I transmitted them on a on a, a transmitter that had no receivers as well, the sort of double sort of extinction silencing that, that was very lo-fi and, and quite um, quite sort of just for the environment itself. So I guess um, one of the themes of collecting that I'm kind of engaging with here is, is what Elsner and Cardinal describe as the urge to erect a permanent and complete system against the destructiveness of time, um, which, yeah, I guess in Reich, Reichek's... Um, hands was this very permanent sort of archive of specimens. And when thinking about sound recordings, I, I do often wonder whether we're doing the same thing as sound recorders, like collecting what a friend of mine, Amy Fletcher, who's also written on de-extinction, calls a sort of library of dead sounds. So... This is collected silence for Lord Rothschild when it had been taken off the island, and I put it into um, a couple of exhibitions. This is this is in Harley as well, um, but it's it's a, it's also sort of a, an archive um, format, which has had um, yeah like more editions put back into it as well. So collect recollecting these sorts of um, dead extinction silences is sort of an ongoing process. Um, and in a 2013 paper um, on the work, uh, Dougal McKinnon for, for um, Leonardo Music Journal, he, he talks about it as the musicalization of acoustic silence made possible by the intentional act of recording that functions an, as a framing device for acoustic silence. But when the intention of the work is ecological, acoustic silence takes political form. The gap between the acoustic absence of, of the silence thing and the Cajun silence we hear all around it calls attention to the irre irrecoverable loss inherent in that heterogeneous silence. Um, so I guess um, in Reichek's collections, this really small moment of encounter happened that really made me think um, one of the things I was really interested in all the time when working with these extinct silences was the personalization. Like I think with um, concepts like the sixth mass extinction or extinction generally, we tend to think in very generalised, very sort of, you know, massive kind of monumental terms about these issues. But I found two owls that were, they were from where I lived and just down the road um, in a place called Silver Stream, which I could walk to. So what I decided to do was record their silences and take them back home. And so these owls had been collected in um, 1884 and they'd been in the collections in Vienna ever since. So I thought, well, I'll reverse the trajectory of colonial acquisition and take them back and play their silences back into the landscape. So I, I did a, a small work where that happened um, called Twin Signals at Silver Stream, Fragments of a Landscape, for specimens 50766 and 50767. We don't know their real names. Um, yeah, so... I guess from that encounter, that small encounter with those with those owls, um, you know, that a more personal kind of take on extinction became available to me that was more affective and, um, yeah, the narrative around it became a bit more explicable to other people as well. That was shown in a gallery space locally and, and people talked about the, the story and, and the owls, you know, they weren't as these anonymous study skins trapped in Vienna for 130 years anymore. So I thought that was quite a nice thing to do for them. Yeah, there's me with another version of the same owl in Christchurch. Um, on the 100th anniversary of its official extinction, I, I just went and recorded it that day. And here's me in Victoria in the museum here with a, the, the only fledgling of the same owl, just doing this very this sort of ongoing collecting process, which is quite 
almost a parody of the scientific process in some ways, but it is incredibly rigorous at the same time, like a sort of archival collection process. Um, my other uh, kind of ongoing strand around these works has been around a bird called the huya, which um, you mentioned in your introduction. Um, and I was thinking um, that, yeah, this, this bird needs a little bit of an introduction, but I won't go on too long. It's, it's, it's a bird that's um, very, it's become an icon of extinction in New Zealand because it was incredibly um, important to pre-contact Maori culture. Like it was um, uh, a sort of a, a very well integrated non human human relationship that Maori had with the huia. Like they used its feathers as a kind of symbolic bartering system. Um, they talked to it um, and called it from the forest. They taught it to speak. Um, so it, it, it became extinct in the early 20th century because of the massive overhunting by Victorian collectors um, and its. Uh, its unfortunate sort of fashion status because its feathers were transferred from the indigenous symbolic economy to the Western one, and this overhunting happened, whereas um, the indigenous uh, cultures um, that had protected it did, did, didn't ever overhunt it um, because they had more ecological protocols than, uh, than the Western colonization systems that, that violently replaced them. So, so sadly, the huia is no longer with us, but um, some traces of its song still exist, and I've been digging them out of archives for a number of years. So this is one work um, which um, just was very simple, like just paper music box strips on index cards um, with the the musical notation of the bird song that people play in the gallery. And it was shown in Sydney and also in London. And it was, um, I think it was a nice, uh, very, very analog interactive work. Um, and then I did the other one that, um, that, that's been mentioned um, called uh, um, Collected Huya Notations, um, Like Shells on the Shore Where the Sea of Living Memory Has Receded, <laughs> which is um, a quote from Pierre Nora um, about his idea of Lire de Memoir, um, which are sort of cultural practices that draw people together as memory. So I got my friend Pascal Harris, who's a virtuoso pianist, to play some uh, extinct bird scores that were then cut to wax cylinders um, here in Australia, in, um, in Canberra, at the National Film and Sound Archive, because they were doing a project around um, uh, re reviving um, the recording technologies of the 19th century for a project. So um, they generously agreed to help me with this. And then I have exhibited this uh, wax cylinder in a, in a gallery in Hobart and um, framed it as um, kind of a, a voice coming back from the dead, even though I was quite critical of that notion. And I think framing it on 19th century recording technologies, which could also be used in playback, which is what phonographs um, in that era were for. They were, they were um, domestic technologies that could also be used as recording mechanisms. Um, and framing it as this very vernacular um, kind of obsolete technology, which is the only recording mechanism that was around when the Huya was alive, uh, really crystallised, um, you know, the loss. And, and it, it became this work of mourning that, that was quite effective um, and quite interesting to people, I think. And this is me in, um, in Turin, uh, the, the exhibition for the Share Festival um, that's already been mentioned. So collected Hui notations had its, um, had its day there. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was also something that I think was engaging with the, um, the notion of, of the audibility um, uh, of, of a kind of silence that's human, um, but also touches on uh, the history of, of this, um, this lost sound. So I've begun to think of all these works collectively as sort of a recollection in both the sense of an alternate archive and a space of memory, and also a kind of elegiac form, poetically listening out for lost sounds and silences in the critical histories of landscape and tracing how this intersects with technology, the museum and the archive um, as an ongoing process of critical understanding of how sound and erasure function together within the settler colonial project. So this is a critical listening that potentially inverts the cataloging function. Um, that we see in 19th century collecting, but also in this sort of obsession with um, pinning everything down and with data sets, with naming. Um, 
So uh, I guess um, I think I think that's probably all I've got. Um, I might end it there, actually. Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to take any questions if anyone's got them. Yes, I, I do have questions, Salian, and, and thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I, my question is, is inspired by uh, the traditional Maori instrument you, sh you showed, by what you said, by your own location, and also by one of the questions we had before. So I was wondering, does the loss of bird species, which I think is often due to uh, European colonialist uh, enthusiasm for killing wildlife, so does this loss of, of animal species have a, a different resonance among uh, uh, indigenous communities? Is it something that you've had an opportunity to talk about with them? Yeah, well, of course, these are not my ontologies or my histories. I'm a, I'm a settler colonial uh, kind of uh, person of English extraction, so I, I can't really speak for anybody here. But I suppose um, there's a there's a sort of feeling um, in New Zealand because we have we have a, a bicultural and bilingual um, uh, culture. Um, that uh, indigenous uh, histories are, are well known. And I think histories um, of birds, um, because birds, um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but we, we only had birds in New Zealand and, and the long history of human interaction with birds goes back the 600 years of Maori um, culture and then the less than 200 years of uh, settler colonial culture after that. So, so we've got this long history of human interaction with birds. And that's um, very, I think it's really unique in the culture as well, like as a, as a sort of um, certainly a, a national pride kind of thing. So, so there's a whole, the whole bunch of layers of, there's kitsch layers and there's, there's kind of human, non-human communication layers and there's sort of all these different cultural relationships that we have. But, but yeah, like I, I think um, the Indigenous uh, histories are, are a massive part of that. And I think um, it's it's really important to um, anyone working in New Zealand with with the idea of nature to really um, engage with those histories as much as um, they can within, within those frameworks. Thank you. Yeah, we don't really have the opportunity here in Europe, um, at least. Um, unless you live really in the north of Europe. So, yeah, thank you so much, Sally. So now we have uh, something like 20 minutes to have a short debate. But um, before we, we, we kind of talk together, uh, a question arrived for, for, for Tina. So, so Tina, uh, we have a question from Sebastian Camao, who, uh, who asks, how do you balance the material needs of the rhino horn with the cultural significance it has for people who drive the demand for it. Are you still here, Tina? Yes, I was talking with my <laughs> muted <laughs> speaker. But yeah, I think uh, what I was saying is that I, I do think that that, that is such an important question to ask, and it's a hard one to answer as well, because you have so many examples of previously um, similar projects. So, for instance, if we go on the diamond example, which is quite similar in that sector, that it's you can simulate it purely for its material value, but then it doesn't translate on like in terms of how it does relate to the commodity uh, to to its environment it doesn't relate to how it's embedded in the in a specific culture when you do it specifically synthetically so with the rhino horn what we're trying to do is actually be really careful of this jump because there's so many uncertainties of how you actually convey it as for the attachment that people actually hold to those material because as I said, it, it is not about the materiality itself. It's more about the provenance of the material, the uh, luxury of it being so rare and being so exploitative to, to a specific degree, but as well as this notion of believing that because it is linked to a specific specimen, it, it provides a certain medical uh, uh, relief for a, for a short term. So how I think... The, uh, the biggest challenge of this project is then how do you shift this mentality from jumping 
through someone wanting to have a rhino horn because it's located on a rhino to someone wanting to have a rhino horn that they can control and that it's still quite linked to the rhino and that you have the same emotional or either uh, like attachment to it, but without the rhino in between. Hopefully this answers the question somehow. <laughs> well, the answer was interesting, so hopefully... Uh... Um, so I have, I have a, a couple of questions for, for all of you or anyone who wishes to answer. Oh, before I go there, um, I want to say um, that Christian, Christina had to leave. Uh, it's one of the joys of the pandemic when you're, when you're a mother and you have to, you have to work and, and uh, organize this childcare. Anyway, so the question I have um, for all of you is... Uh, uh, what is be, uh, be behind this drive that you have as artists to bring back to our senses lost species or even lost ecosystems? Is it because uh, somehow it feels safer or maybe easier to evoke the past than to look into the future? Because the future right now is uh, it's kind of a bit scary. So, yeah, I don't know if it's a question that inspires any of you. Yeah, maybe I can try to answer that. Can you hear me? Is everything yeah. working? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, like the starting point about looking into the history of this uh, uh, paleobotany examples that spring up here and there uh, all around us, in fact, was this uh, urge and this scientific quest, for example, of searching uh, of how this first flower that appeared on Earth uh, looked like, and all of the speculations and this uh, especially 3D reconstruction, this scientific text uh, that was authored by many, many uh, scientists, uh, this 3D reconstruction of how this flower actually looked like that. It's, it has this uh, aura of uh, mysteriousness about it, but it, there is something so iconic in it, uh, in a way. And it looks like magnolia, it looks like many different uh, flowers and objects. And throughout uh, like the ancient sculpture, you also notice these floral elements that uh, appear in many places. And I also tie that to appearance of uh, gargoyles on architecture that also has multiple uh, uh, functional purpose on buildings to actually protect the architecture, protect the people in there, but also have a practical function of uh, like maybe uh, taking the water away from the building and protecting the habitat and whatnot. And this is like the entry point of all of the elements I wanted to include into these new objects that are uh, somehow these syn synthetic hybrids in a way uh, with all of these technological elements. Um, someone else wants to contribute? Yeah, I will. Uh, oh, sorry. Would you like to do that? You can go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I was I was just thinking about the fact that um, uh, you know the idea that we don't actually know everything about the past, um, that the archive is, is full of secrets and it, it's data, but there's lots of narratives that can be drawn out of the past that um, we don't actually uh, know or, or that haven't been told. So I, I'm not sure if I'd put that dialectic between the known past and the unknown future or the yeah, the boring past and, and the exciting future, because I, I think there's pasts in the future and futures in the past, if you know what I mean. Like, I, I think drawing out speculative narratives can happen with um, ancient material, which we're, we're seeing so well in this um, presentation with all the, the different paleo um, kind of botany things and, and everybody's research. So, yeah, I mean, that's something I've learned a lot about today. Yeah, I think too, um, something I found with the project that I did with the bird, like me, I mean, we're actually a team making these projects, but um, the project with the bird in Hawaii, similar to what Sally is mentioning, like Sally mentioning like the Watchfield family or before in the presentation we heard about like um, a, in, the, in like the 1900, how a flower became, or 1900, I think it was, a flower became extinct on Hawaii. 
but like with the bird, for example, it's like I really learned it. The project taught me to think across a, a linear timeline and it learned me not just to think kind of one directional because what happened with that bird was that there was a ship with a horse and on the horse were mosquitoes. The ship was going to Mexico, but the ship stopped in Hawaii in the early 1800s. These mosquitoes carried avian malaria. So it's like alien, uh, avian malaria entered the, uh, the island almost 200 years ago. The avian malaria climbs up the mountain. And in the 90s, there comes a hurricane, two hurricanes to this plateau in Hawaii. And not just one, but many species go extinct in one go at once. You know, it's like because of the hurricane in a way, but really because of the avian malaria, because the birds could no longer fly into valleys to protect themselves, which is how they protect themselves against uh, hurricanes. So you have a ship with a horse, you have a mosquito, you have a hurricane, you have a 200 year period. And then in one, in one instant, many species go extinct. So you're like, you can't really think anymore in these human terms of like, what is just the future and the past in a way? Like I could, I don't know, I could throw an apple in the ground out here and then maybe in 20 years there's a tree, this tree falls over and kills someone. It's like, did I, did I indirectly, you know, did that result of someone dying? I mean, it's a bad example, but that is kind of what happened with all these birds, you know? Like someone's just sailing and they have a horse and indirectly yeah. they're actually killing all these birds 200 years later. So I think like with this technology, virtual technologies allows us to sample or even like, I mean, technology at large. Sally's work also is like medium technology, like registration can make us mix different time scales and things together and create some perceptions around these indirect causalities. And I think we have gone too accustomed to think linear in control, kind of. Um, so that's how I think about it. And I already think that a lot of these projects actually are the future because mm. more and more species will vanish. So in the future, it's going to be more common that many species, I mean, as the way it's going, not the way I hope it's going. Uh, there are probably many birds in 20 years that you can only hear virtually. And that's just how it's going to be the, at the rate it's going. So actually, a lot of these works are, are kind of in the future already. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, what you just said uh, made, me, made me want to ask you, so as, in, as engaging so closely with extinct forms of life, um, has it made it more optimistic or more pessimistic about the future of this planet and also about the role that technology is playing in shaping it for the, for the better or, or the worse? Because... Um, yeah, there are good signs, but there are so many bad signs. So I, I was wondering, like, when you are so much deep into the research around extinct forms, how much, how much does it shape your perspective and your optimism about uh, the future of biodiversity? I think, can I, maybe I can start answering that. I think the the thought that possibly keeps me up at night when you're researching something from the past and when you see how, many, how much technological progress is there in order to resurrect it, is that actually do we then start to value nature less when we are aware that we can part, bring parts of it back? And essentially, does this devalue nature in terms of like on a, lar on a large scale? I think a, a possible good case against it would be something that I think throughout this uh, panel we all reiterated that is essentially impossible to bring back species uh, uh, from the past as you would imagine them, so in their original state. So essentially when you're embedding an, uh, a long lost species, you're embedding it into a totally new environment with a totally different set of parameters. And also while we are designing it, we need to be realistic that we have nothing to compare these species against. So therefore, we are not entirely sure if we are creating the exact replica of what we tend to create. It might be that it's completely different. And I think um, George Church, actually a researcher that's trying, also one of the leading forces of extinction, put it quite well when he framed the dinosaur actually as a giant chicken. Because the future, like if we would to, um, 
the extinct, uh, the extinct dinosaur, that will actually what it would be because it would be tweaked DNA from the chicken. So I think that um, this understanding gives me more hope in order for people to actually see the validity of preserving what we actually still have and therefore trying and yeah, and therefore trying to apply those techniques, not just towards species that are completely lost, but maybe towards species that are going to extinction. Because for yeah. me, I, I get you usually asked which species would I bring back to life if I could bring any. And I say I always say that the, the extinction for me, it's not just a, a general uh, technology that should be or shouldn't be applied. I think it's really based on a case-to-case -case basis. And for instance, something that I could see a really, uh, a really valid um, uh, use of this technology is bringing back like species such as the uh, northern white rhino, which has just been extinct because obviously the last male have made extinct. They still have other siblings, and therefore there is a true potential of bringing back a species that will otherwise be lost. Um. Someone else wants to answer whether you're optimistic or pessimistic? Mm. Such <laughs> <laughs> a hard question. Interesting. I, I, yeah. There is actually, uh, I mean, I'm piggy, piggybacking on what Tina just said. I just remember that um, I saw a documentary about the, the last uh, white male rhino. And, um, well, I could not watch it to the end. It was really too sad. And he became a kind of tourist attraction. You know, people took, um, I don't remember in which country it was, but they took really, really great care of, of, of him. But they had very little, they didn't have enough money. So he was part of a, a touristic tour of endangered species. Um, and I, I think the documentary is called The Last White, White Male or something like that. It's by a, a young Dutch uh, filmmaker. Uh, if I find it, uh, I'll try to, um, to uh, maybe text the link uh, in, in, the, in the chat. Uh, but sorry, I, I interrupted. Uh, someone wanted to say something about whether you're optimistic or, or pessimistic. I mean, I, I need hope because I tend to be very, very pessimistic. Um. Um, so, I mean, something that I, that gives me purpose is to saying that um, let's think about technology or like uh, the sound of an extinct bird is also like movement, sound, and there's also like colors in the specimen. There are a lot of things that with technology, with art, you can create kind of make like almost like ritualistic experiences around. And as humans, it, this is just how I think, you know, people think many differently, but I think that we are deeply kind of ritual beings. So without rituals that are like through physical movement, color, sound, these kind of things, it's hard for us to really feel connected to the world around us. And I think mm. a lot of modern technology society, like the way we live right now, basically, has is taking that away from us more and more. And that means it's very hard to connect. Like, you know, you you can tell someone that a bird is about to go extinct, but it's very hard to feel connected to that. Like even mm. Douglas, this ornithologist that spent 40 years of his life studying this bird, is like in the VR piece, as you put on the headset, you go through the beginning of his, like a quote from my conversation with him, and he says that, like, uh, they knew, so this was in the 60s, they went and documented this plateau where the bird used to live, and they did an expedition, and he's like, he said, they knew they were rare at the time, and they knew this, and they were becoming uh, threatened, but they could never imagine that they would actually go extinct. Mm -hmm. It was outside his imagination to even imagine this, you know, but it did, and this is even, like, a deeply dedicated scientist to the area, and even to him, it just kind of caught him by surprise in a way. So it's like, I think we need to build these all sorts of tools, art, stories, songs, whatever it is for the condition we live in. So, I mean, this is like, as an artist, artist, really how I, how personally I would think in the end. And in that way, I'm optimistic that, you know, I mean, we have a panel like this. <laughs> I don't know, there are festivals that are like, I mean, as long as there are spaces to share, um, stories like that in one medium or another, and then, uh, yeah. I don't 
Well, thank you. <laughs> that, that makes me slightly less pessimistic. And the documentary about the white rhino is called The Last Meal on Earth. I have... Um, one last question, which uh, is from the chat, and it's, uh, does technology prom uh, promising a better future, or is it that by its design, it essentially works counterproductively, accelerating problems rather than generating solutions? I think it's a bit both, but... Um what do you think? Yeah, technology is a tool like uh, any any other tool, and it depends on on us what we do with it, how we plan its construction, and what are we going to do in the future with specific things. I mean, let me just quickly go back to the previous question. I uh, really try to be optimistic, no matter what is happening, and not to undermine that. A lot of species are going extinct. We have really big problems with that. But there are also a lot of species who are happily existing nowadays. So on the one side, we have species who have adapted to what we want. Like, for example, I've chosen as one flower who is happily here with us for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, we have this orchid we, that we play with for years and years, and we just enjoy it. It can be kitschy, it can be uh, all over the, our environments. And for example, vanilla orchid, it's so present in our lives that it's completely unbelievable how this plant got attached to our species, for example. Or there are lots of examples of uh, so-called ghosts of evolution, plants that uh, in a way don't have any role in ecosystems. Like, for example, there is this very bizarre tree. It's called uh, in some vernacular languages like horse apple. It has a big fruit. It's completely sticky. Nobody eats it. You can't do anything with, uh, with it. I usually, I sometimes find this tree. It's so fascinating and beautiful. And this is also something we can think about. You know? So it's not all bad. There are good elements in everything that's happening uh, now. So we could focus on that and try to remedy what's uh, obviously going bad. There are a lot of bad stuff happening also. Um, yeah, I'm going to play the pessimistic role because when you say there are some species that are with us and that seem to be thriving, I immediately thought about cockroaches and mosquitoes, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is me. Um, and rats, rats. Rats are everywhere. I'm yeah, they, they also caused quite a lot of extinctions. Um, yeah. Maybe someone has a concluding word? I I think I will just basically echo what Tanya has said, which is essentially it's not we always portray we're always portrayed even by like uh, movies or by other types of like entertainment. This scenario when technology just evolves and creates this evil bad against humanity and we have nothing to do with it. But as Tanya pointed out, this is just a tool and we we are responsible for it. And I think especially why it's important uh, what we actually do, so art and design, it's to provoke those debates ahead of the time when those actually happen and have those mm, debates around the limites, uh, the, the, the limits of our uh, ethical will and the boundaries that we are willing to push. And whilst we do that, we can then decide how to utilize those, the technology. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's a good moment where well, we have to close anyway because time uh, it's already almost eight here in, in Italy. So thank you so much, uh, Tina, Tania, uh, Jacob. Jacob especially for being uh, the only guy in this uh, perfectly uh, <laughs> gender-balanced panel. Thank Gender you, <laughs> Thank you, Salian. Thank you. Thank you. To, to go. And um, yeah, Jiva, um, it's, it's, I, I give you the mic back. Thank you, Regine, Jacob, Salian, Tina, Tanya, and Christina for being with us today.
Thank you everyone who's been watching online and don't miss the rest of our program, which you can follow on kiblix.org or our social media. Next week, we continue with the series of workshops, Glitch Art 101, led by Dina Karadzic and Vedran Gligo. And on Thursday, you can follow the 24-hour live stream of the Seeing Eye the Other project by Mark Farid, a 360-degree first-person point of view video. Stay with us and good night and see you next time.